Welcome everyone. We are going to be in Genesis 35, but before we go there, please turn to Genesis 28. Genesis 28, I want to give some background information uh, before we jump into Genesis 35 that will kind of explain why Genesis 35 is such an important chapter in the life of Jacob. In Genesis 28, I'm going to look at just a couple of verses there, starting in verse 17. And this is speaking of Jacob. It says, And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So this is the night that God appeared to Jacob in the vision of the ladder, with angels um, ascending and descending, and God at the top of the ladder. And during this that vision, God had given Jacob a number of promises. And in verse 18 and 19, Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. So the next morning Jacob wakes up early, he takes the rock that he was using as a pillow, and he turns it up and he makes a pillar out of it, or, or memorial, and he poured oil on it to consecrate it, which just means set it apart, something special. And he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. Now verse 20-22. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. So Jacob makes this promise. He says, God, if you will do as you've promised to do, which is basically care for me, uh, take care of me, bring me back to this land again, safe and sound. He says, God, you will be my God. You will be now my God. And I will come back to Bethel, specifically that place, and I will make an altar to you, and I will worship you there as the Lord, as my God at Bethel. So last week we saw that Jacob was back in the promised land. He was at Shechem though, not at Bethel. And Shechem is north of Bethel about 20 miles. So uh, Jacob has not, not quite kept his vow completely to God at this point. And the Lord, um, the Lord is his God. He said, you know, you'll be my God. And he is Jacob's God now. But so far, he has not gone down to Bethel to make this altar and to worship God as he had promised. Um, as a side note, uh, just some advice, I would be very careful about making vows to God. Um, God takes your promises, your vows to him very seriously, even if we don't. He, he, he wants us to keep our vows to him. It would be much better to not promise God or vow anything to God than to make a vow or a promise and not keep it. Um, he doesn't ask you to make a bunch of vows. And so when you make a vow or a promise to God, as I said, He takes them seriously even if we don't. So this week in chapter 35 of Genesis, we're going to see God move in Jacob's life uh, in such a way as a, to get him to fulfill this vow. And that will take us to Genesis 35. So before we jump into the, the meat of our, of our lesson, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for your word. I really thank you, Father, that we can trust your word. I thank you, God, that your word um, is a foundation for us, that in troubled times it is a sure foundation that we can rest on, that we can trust. And God, I just thank you that you um, allow us to get together, even uh, over the Internet, to where we can still have a Bible study, Father. I ask that you bless this time. I ask God that you please fill me with your spirit, that you would speak through me the words that you want me to say, Father, and that those people out there listening would be fed your word and that you would just open their ears up to what you want them to hear, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So Genesis 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Then God said, <laughs> After the disaster of chapter 34, which we talked about last week, I'm not going to go into the details of that, 
but after that has happened, probably some time has gone by, and it says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. So after all of Jacob's failure in chapter 34, God wants him to still come and worship him. Um, when you and I sin, we don't lose our salvation. But sin, left unconfessed, does break your fellowship with God. And God doesn't want us to wallow in that failure, though. He wants us to come to Him, confess our sin, agree with God that it was sin, uh, and then enjoy being restored to, his, to fellowship with God and to be able to worship Him. Uh, if you have something in your life that um, God is dealing with you on, there's something, uh, some sin in your life, uh, you won't be able to worship God. Not really. You'll, you'll, um, you'll be sing, singing and, and the Holy Spirit will be nudging you and say, hey, you got to take care of this. Uh, you'll have no peace as a Christian if you're living in sin. When, you, when God points out sin to you, what He wants us to do is confess it. God, you're right. That is sin. But confession is also got to be tied with repentance of sin. So it doesn't do any good to confess a sin if you're going to keep doing it. That's not confession, because repentance must follow. There must be a turning from that sin uh, in obedience to what God wants you to do. Now, that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be perfect, but it does mean that you are going to try, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to live in obedience. That's repentance. And God does want us to repent. Uh, if there's an area in your life that, we're, that you're fighting God on, he, he loves you, He has the best for you, and part of that best is to get you to repent at times. To humble yourself and say, yep, I shouldn't be doing that, God, I see that, and I'm willing to change. Verse 1 again, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau your brother. So he says, Jacob, I want you to get up. I want you to go up to Bethel, up in elevation, up to Bethel. And I want you to stay there. I want you to live there. And I want you to build an altar to me. And I want you to worship me. And this, God says, and that's the place, Jacob, remember where I appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. In other words, what God is saying to Jacob, Jacob, it's time for you to keep the promise that you made to me. Um, many Bible teachers Many Bible commentators say that uh, it was a mistake uh, that Jacob, it was a mistake for Jacob to go to Shechem, that he should have gone right away to Bethel out of obedience. Uh, it is true that had Jacob done this, uh, more than likely the rape of his daughter would not have happened. If Jacob had never gone to Shechem, the, the murders that his sons committed, the pillaging of the city of Shechem would not have happened. When we obey God, you never know the troubles that you avoid. Uh, and you may not know on this side of eternity the, the troubles that you avoid when you walk in obedience. But the reverse is true as well. When we disobey God, you never know until later on uh, the troubles that we bring upon ourselves because of our disobedience and then those around us, the people around us that suffer because of our disobedience. Obedience to God leads to blessing. It also leads to you avoiding problems that you will encounter if you disobey God. Jacob uh, did not go to Bethel. He went to Shechem, and we saw the problems back in chapter 34. So it, I will agree that Jacob, that Jacob should have fulfilled his vow to God. And that is undoubtedly probably true. But, but, why didn't God demand right away that Jacob go down, or go, excuse me, go up to Bethel? Um, he was there about 10 years. Why didn't God say, now is the time, go now? Why did he wait 10 years? I believe it's because God knew that Jacob wasn't ready to go to Bethel. He wasn't in a place spiritually when he was ready to go deeper in his relationship with God. Our Heavenly Father, He's not going to tell you to do something that He's not going to equip you to do. He's not going to tell you to do something that you cannot do. Now, it may have to be done and probably will be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. But God doesn't call you to do something that He's not going to equip you to do, that, that you're not able to do. Jacob is ready now to fulfill this vow 
uh, to God. In other words, Jacob is at a place to go into a more deeper relationship with God. God works this way with you and me. If you've been a Christian uh, three or four years, you're still a, a new Christian, relatively speaking. You're still new in Christ. You're still a babe in Christ. And hopefully you're growing. And then you'll reach a point where you think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm now a mature saint. And you'll go along and you'll be fat, dumb, and happy. And all of a sudden, you'll be in church one day or in prayer or reading the Word. And God will say, hey, by the way, I want you to deal with this. And then you find yourself at a crossroads where, okay, if, I, if I'm going to continue on in my relationship with God growing, I've got to deal with this area. It may be something that God wants you to give up. It may be something that God wants you to do. It may be someone that God wants you to go speak to, apologize to, witness to, wh whatever it might be. You will find that your Christian life uh, is not just one straight line. Hopefully it's always going up, and by up I mean more and more in the image of Christ. Uh, and there's detours sometimes, some of us take big detours, but hopefully you're moving forward, your sanctification process is going on, and you're, you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, but there will be plateaus where you think, okay, I've, I've, I don't, I, I don't want to say this, um, I've arrived, quote unquote. And then God will say, no, it's time to go deeper. It's time to, for you to grow more in the grace and knowledge of Christ. And I don't care if you've been a saint, five years or 50 years, God will never stop dealing with you. Uh, is, it, is it because He's a Father that just can't be pleased? No, not at all. It's because He loves you. He knows the best for you is to be conformed in the image of your Son. But I can promise you that God's not going to lay the same burden on a new baby Christian that he would on a Christian who is 30 years in the, in the faith and has been growing, uh, growing that whole time. And we shouldn't do that either. We should not lay burdens on new Christians. Uh, we should not let God work in their life. If you see things that they shouldn't be doing or things that they should be doing, yeah, if God leads you to say something, then, then say something in love. But I would encourage you to make sure God's leading you in that direction before you go to them. Pray, pray about it. Pray for them. Love them. Don't put them under a burden or a, a conviction that maybe they're not ready to handle yet. And so I think that what you see with Jacob uh, being in, the, in Shechem for 10 years, I believe it was, is God letting him grow. He's, he's letting him grow. He's just, he's just gotten into a serious relationship with God. You know, when he, just before he got back to the promised land, before he met Esau, he just developing his relationship with God. He had that wrestling match with Jesus, the, the pre-incarnate Son of God. It wasn't Jesus, but that is who would become. I'm babbling here. Um, <laughs> He got in a, in, a, in a wrestling match with the pre-incarnate Son of God, who we would know as Jesus. Um, he's gone through some stuff. He's got that limp. Um, and God gave him time to grow, but now God says it's time. Then God said to Jacob, Jacob, it's been 10 years. You've grown. I'm, I'm glad that you've grown. Uh, I, I love you, Jacob, and, and, I, and I'm pleased with you, but now I want you, Jacob, to arise. I want you to go up to Bethel, Jacob, and I want you to dwell there for a while. And I want you to make an altar there to God, to me, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Um, this was the fourth time, by the way, that God has appeared to Jacob that God has spoken to Jacob. And this is, just for those of you who are sort of uh, Bible nerds, this is the only time, this is the first and the only time in the book of Genesis that God told one of the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were the patriarchs. Jacob was the only one that God ever said, you build me an altar. Um, why is that? Because God is encouraging Jacob to get on with keeping his vow. I, I will tell you that I think God is so much more loving and so much more gracious with us than we are with each other or than we are with ourselves. 
I, I think God looks at us and says, I know you're but dust. You're my son. You're a child of God. Uh, you're a new creation. All that is true. But you're still in that body of dust, that body of flesh. And he's very gracious to us. Very, very gracious to us. And he's being gracious to Jacob. He's given Jacob 10 years in the promised land. Now he says, Jacob, there's some things I want you to deal with. And one of them is you've got to go down and, and, and fulfill this vow. Now we get to a section where we see maybe some, one of the things that was holding Jacob back. Verse 2, And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. You go, what? Yeah, Jacob's family has got some issues. And so Jacob... Um, taking some spiritual leadership for maybe the first time in his life, says, we got some things we got to take care of. Three things. First, he says, get rid of these idols. You might remember that when Jacob fled his uncle Laban, that Rachel helped herself to the family idols that Laban had. And she snuck them out and she hid them. Now, Jacob did not know that they were there. In fact, when Laban confronted Jacob, he was like, you could look, all, look anywhere you want. Uh, they're not in this camp. And Jacob didn't know about it at the time. Undoubtedly, because of this verse, Jacob had found out about it. And um, he had not, up to this point, told his wife to get rid of them. Um, that's not right. Uh, Jacob wasn't doing what he should do. And, and, but I'll tell you what, I'm, I'll let God and Jacob, God deal with Jacob on that because, um, you know, sometimes doing the right thing, we should do it, we don't. And then this is one of those cases where Jacob didn't, he should have gotten rid of those idols. Um, God was so gracious to him. And I would say there's a lesson in there for us somewhere. But he, now he says, get rid of these idols. God has called me to go to Bethel. I'm going to make an altar to him. But number one, tells his family, get rid of those idols. Secondly, if you look in verse 2, he says, purify yourselves. Cleanse yourselves. What is that about? I believe what he's saying there, you, we as a family have some things we have to issue, deal with. Some sins that we have to confess. The murder. The some of the, just the covetousness, the stealing, the, the pillaging of Shechem and other things. He says, we need to confess our sins. Before we make this journey, let's examine ourselves and purify ourselves. And then thirdly, he says, change your garments. Change your garments. Um, another word for garments would be a habit. Uh, what he's saying there is, we need to change some things about ourselves and we need to put away some old things our old ways that hinder our relationship with God um, Jesus said at best you can't put new wine into old wine wine skins and basically what if you look at verse 2 this is a very good um, recipe if you will for revival both for yourself for your family for a church for a nation those three things, put away the foreign gods, whatever it is that you've elevated ahead of God, get rid of them. Purify yourself, confess your sin. God, we have sinned. Third, change your garments. Get rid of things that are hindering your walk with God. That is a great recipe for revival. Um, verse three and four. He says, continuing to talk to his family, he says, After we've done this, then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the tabernacle tree that was by Shechem. So Jacob tells his family, hey, we're going to Bethel. I'm going to make an altar to God. And, and this, you got to understand the context. He says, I want to make an altar to God, the God that has, that has answered me when I was afraid, the God that has been with me wherever I've gone, the God who has been faithful to me. He goes, I want to go to Bethel, and I want to make an altar, altar to that God. That is the same God, by the way, that you and I serve today. He will be faithful to you. And this is so important because Jacob is saying, this is the God that has been faithful to me. 
and I want to go worship Him, so we got to get rid of this garbage. That is the same God that you and I worship today. God is just as faithful today as He was in Jacob's time. And this is the neat thing. It's not because of who you are that God is faithful. It is not because of who you are that God loves you. It is not because of who you are that God blesses you. It's because who God is. God <clears throat> is faithful to you because you are His and He is God. He is faithful to you because of who He is, not because of who we are. If His faithfulness, if God's faithfulness was dependent upon us, we would be in real trouble. The truth is, and this is probably not very popular to say, but the truth is, apart from God's grace, we are way more wicked, way more corrupt, way more fallen than we could probably ever imagine. And God is faithful to us, even in spite of those things. When we come to faith in Christ, we're placed in Christ, we're given the righteousness of Christ, we're declared righteous, um, but the body of flesh that we still have, that old man, is a, is a very ugly thing. Paul said, there's nothing good within my flesh, and I would echo that. And uh, if, God's, if God's faithfulness to us was based and depended upon our, our faithfulness to Him, uh, I think we could all agree that our flesh really gets in the way of that. Thank God if God is faithful because He is faithful. So anyways, in 3 and 4, they turn all the idols over to Jacob. They bury him under this tabernacle tree. Um, this may have been the very same tree that's associated with Abraham in Genesis 12, 6, if you want to look that up. Um, also, it says they, they turn in their earrings. Now, this is not uh, a, a teaching that you say that women should not wear earrings. In that day, earrings were associated with idol worship. And it's also very possible those earrings were taken when they pillaged Shechem. So they bury all that stuff, they get rid of it. Verse 5 and 6. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. So God blessed Jacob because of, as, because of his obedience. <clears throat> There's a point here too. God is faithful to us. And it's not because of who we are. It's because of who he is. But don't, don't miss the point that God does also bless obedience. He blesses obedience. And in this case, he blessed Jacob um, because of his obedience by having the cities that he passed by on the way to Bethel leave him alone. The, it says that the terror of God was upon those cities. They were like, we don't want to mess with, with Jacob um, because God had filled them with a fear of Jacob. And so he was protecting Jacob. So he comes to Luz, which he had called Bethel. Verse 7, And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. So Jacob builds the altar, he worships God, and he renames it. He renames it to El Bethel. When Jacob was there the first time, on his or 30 years ago, 30 years before this, Jacob's fleeing from his brother. He has this encounter, and at that time it was the place that impressed Jacob, and he called it the house of God. The place impressed Jacob. Um, he was fleeing. He he he's, he's has this encounter with God, and it's the whole place, the whole the whole thing there. He goes, "This is the place where God's house is." It was the place that was where he'd seen that ladder vision, and he called it Bethel, the house of God. But now, something different, something different. He names it El Bethel. Now it's not the place that is impressing impressing Jacob. Now it's the God of the place that's impressing Jacob. Um, he calls it El Bethel, which means the God, the God of the house of God. It's like Jacob has now moved from being impressed with the location and what happened there, the house of God, to being impressed with God himself. The only thing that I could compare this to is nature. And I was thinking about this, how I would explain this to you. 
we can become so overwhelmed, and we do as human beings, with the grandeur of nature. And it can make, uh, nature can make a person feel very small, very quick. If you've ever been caught outdoors in a thunder and lightning storm, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But it doesn't have to be a negative. It can be something like a, a sunrise. Um, I was on the, we were, my wife and I were at Benson's Beach here some time back and, and I was watching the surf come in and I was thinking just how majestic it was, how powerful it was. And it dawned on me, something so immense as the ocean makes me feel so small that really I only have two options. The first option will be to worship the ocean. The other option, the correct one, is to worship God. In other words, when you see a glorious sunrise, I hope it causes you to worship the sun, the S-O-N, and not the sun, the S-U-N. I hope it causes you to, to not be so enraptured with the beauty of what you're seeing that you forget God. Um, Jacob is at a point now where the place, the, the place is not what's impressing him. What the vision, let's put it that way, isn't what is impressing him. The God of the vision is what's impressing him. It's not the ocean that impresses me. It's the God who created the ocean. One time years ago, my son and I, this is, I mean, this is a long time ago, 1996. We were um, deer hunting over in eastern Washington up in Okanagan County. And it had snowed. And uh, we, were, we were working our way up to the trees and it, the sun was coming up. And I happened to look back at these big open hills and the sun had hit the snow and it turned them purple. It literally was breathtaking. It was like, whoa. And we stopped there and saying how great thou art. Um, it, was, it was not the beauty, it was not the grandeur that impressed me. It made me think of the God who created it. And that's what's happened with Jacob. And I hope I've explained that well, because I'm trying to get the idea of don't, don't forget who created everything. Don't forget, you know, the vision Jacob had was awesome, but it was the God of the vision that he's impressed with now. He knows this God. He's learning more of this God all the time. Verse 6, So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, Somehow I got off. Excuse me, verse 8. The lights are glaring and I can't see my numbers. Verse 8. Verse eight. This verse seems kind of strange. It's kind of thrown in there. But now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. And it's like it just comes out of nowhere. And she was buried below Bethel under the Tebarinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. Um, Deborah was Rebecca's nurse, it says, and Rebecca was Jacob's mom. And evidently, what had happened is um, she, Rebecca, had died, and this nurse, it's, this is what scholars think, came up to give Jacob the message, your mother has died, and then she stayed with Jacob. She's given an honor burial because she was his mom's um, 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 nurse, not maid, but nurse. And... Um, it's just thrown in there, I think, basically to say, hey, Jacob, his, Jacob's mom has passed away. And that's basically why this verse is there. Um, she stayed with Jacob after the mom passed away. And it, most Bible teachers, doesn't, it doesn't say this, but it's implied that most, and most Bible teachers believe this, that Jacob never saw his mom after he left uh, the promised land 30 years before. That for some reason, when he got back to um, Shechem, he stayed there. He did not go to see his mom, um, and then she passed away. Verse 9 and 10. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Pad and Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. So it says God appeared to Jacob. Now this is... A little different. Doesn't say God spoke to Jacob. If you look at verse one of chapter thirty-five, it says God said to Jacob. God said to Jacob. Here it says God appeared to Jacob. So this is a theophany. This is again another time when the pre-incarnate Son of God came down in human form and appeared to a human being. This, in this case, he appeared to Jacob, and it says he blessed Jacob. He blessed Jacob. 
And it also says that God said to him, you're still known as Jacob. Um, but God said in this verse, in this, these two verses, that's not going to be your name anymore. I'm going to call you Israel. Now, what is this about? Because we know a few chapters back after the wrestling match that, that Jacob had with, uh, with the Son of God, that Jacob got that new name Israel. But this is a different situation. The first time, a few chapters back, when Jacob got the name Israel, it was after a struggle. In fact, the, the pre-incarnate son had crippled Jacob, taken out his hip. So after a struggle, he got the name Israel. This time, he's getting the name Israel because of his obedience to God. It changes the whole name, the whole context of the name. Jacob now doesn't say, yeah, I struggled with God. He crippled me and he gave me this name. He can now say, I was obedient to God. And as a blessing, he gave me the name Israel. Ultimately, what God is doing here is renewing his pledge and his promises to Jacob. Verse 11 and 12, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 11 and 12 are the promises. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. God starts off, and I want to point this out, He says, I am Al Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And this is significant. Turn, if you would, with me to Genesis chapter 17. We're going to go back a number of years. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. We're still going to get one verse. Genesis 17, verse 1. When God, excuse me, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. So Abram is 99 years old. God appears to him and says, I am Almighty, I am Almighty God, I am El Shaddai. And then he goes on in chapter 17 to give a whole bunch of promises to Abram. Not the least of which is he says, Abram, you're going to have a son. And you're going to have many descendants. And if God was going to accomplish this for Abram, he needed to be almighty. Because if he wasn't an almighty God, this ain't going to get done. The guy's 99 years old. His wife's 10 years younger. His body ain't working. Her body ain't working. If there's going to be a baby, it's going to take an almighty God to do it. Now go back to Genesis 35. So God introduced himself to Abram this way and says, I am El Shaddai, and I'm going to do this for you. You're going to have a kid and a whole bunch of other things. In chapter 35, verse 11, and also God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and king, and king shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give, and to your descendants after you I give this land. So God is promising to Jacob that I'm going to make a, a great nation. A great nation is going to come from you. Kings are going to come out of your body, Jacob. Um, I'm going to give to you, Jacob, and to your descendants the land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac. And the truth of the matter is, and this is why he says, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. It's because if these things are going to happen, it's going to, have to, take, it's going to take an almighty God to get it done. And that's why he says, I am God Almighty. I can get this done. He is all-powerful. He is El Shaddai. He is Almighty God. He was then, and He still is. And we should rejoice in that. There is nothing our God cannot do. There is nothing our God cannot accomplish. There is no one who can stand against our God. There is nothing that can stand against our God. He is God Almighty. We should just worship Him and revel in the fact that He is also our Dad. My Dad, my Abba Father, is God Almighty. And if you've put your faith in Christ, He is your Father, and He is your God to you, and He is God Almighty to you as well. And if God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? And I think it's going to be important for us in the upcoming months and years to remember that. 
If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's go through verses 11 through 15 again. I want to point out some things. Also, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So after confirming Jacob's new name, again, he says, you're Israel, uh, and promising different things, the Lord left. He went to back to heaven. Now there's some things I want to emphasize uh, in those promises. Um, first of all, it says, God said to Jacob, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Does that ring a bell in your memory? Where have we heard that before? All the way back to Genesis 1.28. What, why is this significant? In fact, why did God say it and why would it be significant? God is tying the original command to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply to Jacob and to his descendants and ultimately to the ultimate descendant, the Son of God that's going to restore this creation and make it what it once was. Be fruitful and multiply. So God is still at work in bringing blessings to mankind, restoring creation, and He's going to do it through Jacob, his descendants, and ultimately the one descendant, Jesus Christ. Then He says that kings shall come from your body. That is the first time that God has mentioned that since all the way back in Genesis 17, which we just looked at. He says, he said in Genesis 17, he says that here now, royalty is going to come from you, Jacob. Kings are going to come from you, but specifically one king in particular is going to come from you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we know his name is Jesus. And then he also promises the land that he first gave to Abraham and to Isaac. He promises it to Jacob or Israel. You're going to get this land. So those three things are very important in this, seri in this series of promises. 14 and 15. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. So to, excuse me, to solemnize the occasion, to commemorate it, Jacob sets up another pillar or a memorial. And it says he poured oil on it, which he had done before, but then he offers a drink offering. This is the first mention in the Bible of a drink offering. A drink offering. Um, a drink offering uh, is not one of the offerings that's commanded in the book of Leviticus. It's not one of the Levitical offerings. It is talked about in, in Numbers chapter 15. It's definitely prevalent. Um, a drink offering is a picture, a type, if you will, of Christ. A type of Christ. Um, a drink offering was always to be poured out and never drunk. Uh, it was never to be drank. It was supposed to be poured out onto an offering. And if you think about a burning offering and you take, it's very hot, you take a, a, a drink offering and you pour it out onto the hot flame, what happens? Steam. It just evaporates and disappears and it's a steam and it goes up as a sweet, savory uh, smell to the Lord. Um, if you would, turn to Psalm 20, 22. There's a couple, of inst a couple of instances of a drink offering that point to Christ, and I just want to show them to you. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 and verse 14. Now, Psalm 22 is a Messianic psalm, and it talks about the crucifixion. In fact, if you've never read Psalm 22, go through. Uh, the very first verse, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very strong description of crucifixion and of the, of, of the punishment that the Messiah would, would, would undergo at the crucifixion. But look at verse 14. He says, I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. I am poured out 
like water. In other words, Christ pouring his life out as a drink offering at the crucifixion. Go up to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53 and verse 12. Isaiah 53 is that great chapter that speaks of the suffering Messiah. And in verse 12 of Isaiah 53, it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And in verse 12, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And we read here in this verse that the Messiah would be poured out he would pour out his soul unto death, and it's like a drink offering, pouring it out. And finally, turn up to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 2, and verse 17. The Apostle Paul says this in Philippians 2, 17. He goes, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Here Paul talks about himself being poured out as a drink offering, poured out on the sacrifice of their faith. Paul was willing and he wanted his life, um, like Christ, to be poured out in sacrifice, to be poured out in sacrifice as Christ as Christ gave his life, Paul was wanting to give his life. I have taken from my life first, Philippians 1.21, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And part of that in my mind is being poured out as a drink offering, giving myself for Christ, giving myself to others. Um, it's just one of those things that I'm, I'm praying through and that praying into my life that God, I want to be able to say for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Um, to me, I think that would be, that's the ultimate, that'd be the ultimate thing to have, been, have said about me. For Flint to live was Christ and to die was gain. Um, I, that's what I want. I want so much to hear when I get to heaven, well done, good and faithful servant. I do not want to hear you lazy, wicked servant. I want to hear well done, well done, good and faithful servant. And uh, I, I believe that most of you do too. And Paul says it this way, I am being poured out as a drink offering. At any rate, go back to Genesis 35. So verse 14 and 15. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So Jacob calls this place Bethel. Uh, and I think this is the same place where he was at before. So he just reaffirming this is the house of God. Very interesting thing that I read uh, that one Bible scholar believes, and it is interesting considering that, that Jacob called this the house of God. He believes that Bethel, this Bethel, not the one that you'll see on your map, was actually the location of the city of Jerusalem. In other words, he believes that where, where Jacob met with with the vision of the ladder, where Jacob um, had this encounter with God again, was actually in the same location that Jerusalem would be at. Um, he didn't say this, but I think he may be implying at the, where the temple would be, um, which it would be cool if that's the case. I don't have no idea, but it is interesting speculation um, that this Bethel is not the one we think of. And he gave some very interesting um, points as to why this might be the case. Um, but who knows? It doesn't really matter. But it is interesting to speculate a little bit, as long as you don't get crazy about it. Verse 16, Then they journeyed, that's Jacob and his family, then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Onai, but his father called him Benjamin. 
So as they go towards um, Ephrath, which we know as Bethlehem, Rachel went into labor. Now we know Rachel had already had one child, Joseph. She goes into labor. It's a bad labor. The midwife says, hey, you know, you're going to have this son. But and just as she's dying, Rachel does give birth. And she says, maybe with her dying breath, she wants this boy to be called Ben Onai, which means son of my sorrow. Jacob, you know, he's there, I think, and he's looking down and he says, no, no, I'm going to call him Benjamin, son of my right hand or uh, son of my good fortune is another way you could say it. It's interesting. Here's this little baby. He's given a name by his mom and a name by his dad. Two different distinct names with two different di distinct um, meanings. One kid. And in this very, very interesting way, Benjamin becomes a type of Christ. And I want you to think about this for a second. To his mother... He was a son of sorrow. To his father, he was the son of my right hand. As Ben Onai, he was the suffering one. The one that would, remember when the, 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 the um, prophecy given to Mary, this child is going to cause your heart to be pierced. This child is going to cause you to suffer, Mary. It says Christ, you know, Christ did that because of what she had to see as his mother. And in that case, uh, Benjamin was Benoni, um, sorrow to his mother. Um, as Benjamin, though, Benjamin would go on to father uh, a tribe that was known as a great warrior tribe. They were tough fighters. Um, this is a tribe that was firmly linked to Judah. And as such, Benjamin becomes a type of the victorious one. And by one, I mean capital O and Christ. So in Benjamin, you have this type, this picture of Christ. Two different things, a suffering and a victorious. The same thing with the Messiah. Jesus was the suffering Messiah. He was the victorious Messiah. They're separated by a period of time. But um, you see that type very beautifully fulfilled in Benjamin. There is a tremendous number of types in the Bible. And uh, again, a type is just a picture, and it only goes so far. But you see in there a picture of Christ. Verse 19, So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Beth, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of, of Edder. So Rachel has died. She's buried on the way to Bethlehem. And Jacob sets up this memorial uh, for her that when Moses wrote this, it was still there. You could definitely go still there and see it. I guess there's still a memorial to Rachel uh, where she's supposed to be buried at today. Um, this tower of Edder he talks about was near Bethlehem. And what it was was just a tower that they built to watch over the sheep. Verse 22. Things are going so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, Rachel's passed away, but um, Jacob has these sons now, and he's, he's, he's just walking with the Lord. And, and then it says in verse 22, And it happened, and it happened, <laughs> when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben, which is his oldest son, went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. So now we have this very disturbing verse here. Uh, as I said, um, Jacob's got this walk on with the Lord, but then it happened. Bilhah was a concubine of Jacob's. Um, a concubine that day had legal status. She wasn't right there with a wife, but just below. And Reuben, his oldest son, had sex with her. Now, this is bad for a lot of reasons, but especially for what it signifies. Of course, it's immoral and that's sin, but it was also a challenge to his father's authority. In those days, if you wanted to assert yourself, you would sleep with the guy's um, wife or his concubines. So what, this, what he's doing is basically a rebellion. He's starting a rebellion against his own father. This will result in him eventually, uh, later on in Genesis, losing the birthright. Uh, the birthright will go to Judah instead. It's interesting um, that it says Jacob heard about it, but didn't do anything. 
He didn't do anything. And I don't know if that's the right thing or if he just said, I'm just going to ignore this. He would deal with it later on in his life. But Jacob didn't choose to make anything out of it at that point in time. This is that one verse that's just thrown in there. Uh, why? Well, to show you that there's some real problems with those sons. Real problems with those sons. And um, part of it is Jacob's fault because of the kind of father he's been. Um, but the sons have to take responsibility for themselves too. Uh, Reuben's about 30 some years old by this point. Going back to the very end of verse 22, um, says, it talks about Reuben. And it says, Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. So we have the record of the 12 sons that were born to Jacob, of course, to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, it says here they were born in Pat and Aram. That's a general statement because we know Benjamin was born uh, right there in the Promised Land. But it's, a, it's an overall statement. Verse 27. Then Jacob came to his father, Isaac, at Mamre, at Kerjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Jacob finally comes down there, and I think he'd visited with his dad before this, but he, he came down and he lives with his father Isaac. This is important because now he's living with Isaac as the heir, not just the second son, but the heir apparent. Uh, when he had left Hebron 30 some years before, he hadn't have any of nothing. Uh, he had the shirt on his back, but God has blessed him. He's coming back with 12 sons probably a few daughters as well, and a tremendous amount of wealth. Verse 28 and 29. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So Jacob lived with his dad for about 12 years, and then Isaac passed away. He was 180 years old, long life. Um, it's I, it's kind of cool, I think, that both of his sons, Jacob and Esau, came. They buried their dad. And it said, um, Jacob died full of days. I think that's pretty cool. It's interesting how this ends, because if you think about it, God now has brought Jacob back completely full circle um, to his father, just as he promised he would. Just as he promised he would. Next week, we're going to take up chapter 36, and we will whiz through that. That's just a bunch of names. Um, I'm going to close tonight. I want to read a passage. Uh, if I'm Isaiah chapter 40. And I just hope that God will speak to you from this passage. Uh, in light of everything that's going on, um, and I just hope that God will take this passage and, and bless you with it. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the, and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. In other words, God, where are you at? Where are you at? There's some bad things happening, and I have a just claim, and you don't seem to be around. God says to Jacob, and he says to us, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall be utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is the same today as he was yesterday. He'll be the same tomorrow. A God that you can trust, a God that is faithful, a God that loves you, a God that is for you. He is on your side or you're on his side, however you want to look at it, but he's for you. God be for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the faithfulness that you showed towards Jacob, uh, towards Isaac, towards Abraham. I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness you've shown in my life. I thank you, Father, for the faithfulness you've shown in the lives of your people here in this church. God, you are a great God, the almighty God. You love us, and we thank you for that. We praise your name, God. We worship you. We worship you. Bring us back here safely next week, Father. And I just pray you bless this word as it's gone out. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.